So today, my guest for this uh, episode of Brain Ponderings is Professor Ted Abel. He's the Chair of Department of Neuroscience and Pharmacology and Director of the Iowa Neuroscience Institute at the University of Iowa. He um, he got he he did his undergraduate work and degree in chemistry at Swarthmore, and then uh, did a master's degree in England, at Cambridge. And then uh, you did postdoc or PhD at Harvard, then postdoc at Columbia. And I think I've got everything right so far. And then you you of went to the faculty at UPenn, the University of Pennsylvania from there. And you spent, you know, most of your research career at University of Pennsylvania, but then you got recruited to the University of Iowa to direct their their neuroscience institute, which is now from what I gather, really, you've done a lot of work and others there built it up, really strong program. Ted Ted is an expert on learning and memory at the cellular molecular levels and circuit levels, but also on sleep and sleep deprivation. Um, his early work focused a lot on kind of the nitty gritty of trying to understand what is learning and memory, how does it work at the cellular molecular structural levels. And then he got interested in sleep and sleep deprivation. Uh, so Ted, um, why don't you briefly, I've already gone on your education, but where were you born and where did you grow up? Did you have parents that were scientists or MDs? How did you get interested in this? No, I, uh, well, I was born in North Carolina. I basically grew up in suburban Philly. My parents moved there when I was six. And uh, so I'm sort of a Philly lawyer. Delo is even more specifically Delaware County, so outside of Philadelphia. So, um, so I grew up grew up there. My uh, my mom was a teacher um, and elementary school teacher. In fact, she was my kindergarten teacher. So she uh, <laughs> set me up for life, I guess. Uh, and my dad uh, was at the uh, disability services of the Social Security Administration. Um, and he actually worked on uh, a number of disability projects there and was eventually head of disability insurance for about a fifth of the United States. Real impacts was in the 80s um, as the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, was emerging. The disability insurance uh, made an administrative decision that individuals that were diagnosed with HIV AIDS would receive not just disability benefit, but also death benefit, because it was clearly at that time an, a disease that was not understood, but clearly fatal. And the impact of that was tremendous to uh, particularly supporting uh, individuals who yeah. were not able to be married to their partners, but suffering from this grave illness. Yeah. It's interesting to see from him the impact that an individual can have. I guess I've inherited from him the focus on of disability. So I also direct an intellectual and developmental disabilities research center at the University of Iowa, which we started a year and a half ago, Lane Strathern and I at Developmental Vision. And our son, Seamus, uh, who's uh, a man, he's a junior at uh, Iowa, he's majoring in German, he's on the autism spectrum. And so I've had experience of, of disability. And so I, there's been a, really an impact. And to me, my it's been an interesting because I, I moved from a, being a chemist to being a neuroscientist. So I'm chair of a department of neuroscience and pharmacology, having never taken a course in either neuroscience or pharmacology. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. But I got into uh, neuroscience because uh, my interest in transcriptional regulation and a molecule PREB. I cloned a fly version of that in my PhD. Moved to the Candel lab to work on mammalian signaling. And it's interesting how that has prepared me to uh, have a son that is diagnosed with autism mm -hmm. and understand behavior. Uh, so it's been yeah. a, a, an interesting trajectory. And coming to Iowa City has been such an opportunity. I, my, my wife says that we've been freed from the force field of the East Coast. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, was, I, I think you know. Well, so I was born and raised in southern Minnesota. I got my PhD at Iowa. Yes, and that, right. that, that was in the early 80s. And back yeah. then, there was some neuroscience, but it was just kind of scattered 
you know, and if, actually a few investigators in the biology department on the one side of the river, and then the, right. you know, a few people and, and mainly neurology clinically oriented people on the, where the medical center is were on the other side of the river. Um, yeah, and, and since then, neuroscience as a as a discipline. Back then, I don't think there were any undergraduate bachelor's degrees in neuroscience. That's right. You know, and now many universities offer bachelor's degrees in neuroscience, and and there weren't many grad. There were, oh, there weren't many graduate programs even in neuroscience oh, back then. Oh, yeah. Cool. Right. So it's grown a lot, and of course, it's the most complicated organ. So it kind of makes sense. Uh, yes. And so why don't you kind of briefly talk about learning and memory, the hippocampus, and kind of the current thinking of how generally it works at the learning and mem at the uh, cellular, molecular, and structural synaptic level. Sure. Yeah, so what's, uh, what my work has focused on has been this process of what's called memory consolidation. So after we uh, go through an event and a learning um, or an encoding event, and in this case, we use uh, mice. And so the mice explore an arena that's like a shoebox and they're moving around the shoebox and there are little objects in it. And they learn about the location of those objects in a five minute, 10 task. Then they go back to their home cage and quite literally think on it and experience this process called consolidation. That's a process that's been studied by a number of investigators. The first one was a guy named Ebbinghaus in the late uh, 1800s in Germany. He did experiments on himself and published 300 page papers, as a, well, 300, literally 300 page papers on the outcome of those experiments. And then more recently, one of my pioneers in this field who's been a big influence on me is a guy named Jim McGall. And there they did a number of experiments showing that what happened after learning could influence your memory. One of the most dramatic experiments that uh, I believe Larry Cahill and Jim McGall did was an experiment in humans. I may have that wrong. It's been a while since I've read that paper, but it was an experiment in humans where they had a series of slides and it was telling a narrative story. And in that narrative story, um, there was a family and they were going downtown and they were going to go visit one of their family members who worked in the hospital. And the, in these slides, there are various details of like colors of cars and, and buildings on streets. And this, the story ends in one of two ways. One is they see their family member in the hospital and have lunch. The other is their family member winds up being hit by a car and is in the emergency room at the hospital. And they, so there's a sort of a neutral ending and a negative ending. And what was very interesting about this work is that the, the negative emotional ending, the emotionally difficult ending of the story, affected the memory of slides that preceded it. So you had better memory of things uh, before uh, that happened before an event that was uh, in this case negative, could be very positive too. And so there's this modulation of memory that happens. We think that if we sit down, like I got an iPad in front of me, I like read the iPad, I learn something, it goes in my head. Well, it, it, it morphs with, uh, with uh, time and with other experience. Another example is a thing called uh, flashbulb memories, where for uh, my parents' generation was, where were you when JFK was shot? Or for, uh, where, for me, my generation, where were you when 9-11 happened? And there were, people really thought you remembered where you were very accurately. What people have learned is you think you remember it very accurately because you probably replay it a lot. But there were experiments that were done around 9-11 where they gave intro psych students uh, a little thing to write down where they were when it happened. And four years later, they asked them, asked them how confident they were. The, the students were not very accurate, but they were very confident. And mm -hmm. so that's an evidence as we retrieve memories, they mod modify and change. So, so it was this modulation of memory that got me very interested in, in the process. From a molecular perspective, what's really nice about it from a big perspective is you channels and then you do something an hour later to manipulate their memory storage. And then you test them a day later to test their long-term memory. So the animals are, are normal when they're trained. You do some transient manipulation, you can do it with a drug or something. And then you come back a day later 
they don't have that drug on board because it's been metabolized, but their memory is affected. And so one of the challenges with memory is a theoretical construct that we measure as a change in behavior. There's a lot of ways to change behavior. You can change behavior because you fall asleep or you've had too much caffeine or you can't pay attention or you can't walk or you can't see. Um, or you can change your behavior because you remember something or don't remember something. So these consolidation experiments have been extraordinarily important for the field because yeah. of the ability to control the stimuli. The other uh, thing about a memory is that it's not, it's not, it's it modified with time. It's also not a single uh, unitary thing. We learn about uh, a context, we learn about where things are in a room. We learn about emotional valence of things. Like there's a book behind me that has a significant emotional valence, a book called Catching, which was written by Elston Howard, the first uh, uh, African-American to play for the Yankees and it's signed by Elston Howard. And I read that as a kid learning how to catch. And so it, it uh, and, and then there's a bobblehead that I got last year at Yankee Stadium of Elston Howard. So that has a context. You can look at it and say, it's the yellow books, yellow cover, and a green writing and you know label and it looks like a yankee uh, person in the back but but to me it's emotional it's from when i was 10 years old uh yeah. being a catcher on the baseball field so these different memory systems are mediated and impacted by different parts of the brain and it's the hippocampus that we focus on and that helps us remember facts and events so for baseball where was that baseball game who was there who won not really whether you liked it or not, just sort of what happened. In mice, it's related to what happens when we put them in a, in a little chamber and they see objects and they remember those objects. So it's spatial contextual memory. In humans, it is conscious memory. We remember that that happened. In animals, obviously we haven't, we don't know that in, in rodents, but in humans, it's a, what's called declarative memory. And a lot of the, the initial coding of memory and the kinds of things is in the hippocampus, right? Uh, uh, and then there's this notion that you get consolidation, and but then that memories may be stored in other brain regions as well. And what yeah, so the aspects of consolidation, we focus on this memory that happens in, in rodents over a day, that probably is mostly within the hippocampus. It then becomes more distributed. I think people have described it as quote unquote, moving to the cortex. I think I would think about it more as becoming distributed to the cortex. The, there's increasing evidence that the hippocampus still plays a role in those memories that have become remote memories. And so there's a sort of, cellular or molecular consolidation, which is what we study at synapses and neurons in the hippocampus. And then there's a systems consolidation it happens over time. And what you find in some of these examples, the uh, it's not a direct example, but for example, as we age, our hippocampal system, as you know, are, are cr critically impacted and decline. But we actually still have very accurate memories I'll still have this memory of being a catcher at 10 years old, even when I'm 90, if I live that long, because that's a more distributed memory. It's in the cortex, not just the hippocampus. And as one memory system decays, the others can sustain those memories. Um, my, so my, fa my father had, uh, so he was diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease when he was in his early 80s. I think it's like 81. And... Okay. You know, he's clearly having short-term memory problems. As you said, he could still remember things from the past. And even as it got really bad, you know, I'd go to see him and I would, him and my grandfather and me used to train and race harness horses, standard breads, trotters and pace. Actually, we'd race on county fairs in Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin. And, um, and so I'd take some of the old... Uh, Ma there's a, a magazine called Hoofbeats. So okay. I take some of those in with me one, from the 1970s, actually. And he'd, you know, I'd open up to a page and you could tell just uh, like the expression on his face that right. he remembered that. But then 
he passed away. Actually, his doctor was Ron Peterson at the Mayo Clinic, who was also Ronald Reagan's doctor. And so they did autopsy and looked at his brain under the microscope, looked at the hippocampus. He, he had some amyloid accumulating, some so-called neurofibrillary tangles, but not actually not enough to make the criteria of Alzheimer's. But what he did have is massive loss of neurons in CA1 of the hippocampus. And I think we'll get to talking about that when you get in the sleep and sleep deprivation because you've done some work. So anyway, that was a case where he, he couldn't learn anything new, right. really. And the hippocampus pretty much wiped out, but he could still recall some things. So somehow, at least maybe not many CA1 neurons, if any, were required for recalling of that. Right, right. Yeah. At least that 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 more remote memory for sure. But yeah, that's the remote the, memory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when did you get interested in sleep? It it's been so, quite a while. Yeah. Ago. So sleep, yeah. So this interest in sleep actually started by uh with a grad student, an MD PhD student uh named Laurel Graves. Oh. Uh, who's now a child psychiatrist uh, CHOP in Philadelphia. She was a student in my lab and uh, she and, a, and a, a senior researcher at Penn studying sleep named Alan Pack are the two that got me interested in thinking about sleep. And so this is how, how, it, how it came about. So we, I need, we need to think a little bit more about the molecular mechanisms of memory and the cellular mechanisms. So when I talk about consolidation, you have this process that's happening over hours as we study it. And I'm a molecular biologist, so I looked, and a number of us have looked at those molecular events that happen over hours. And initially, we see changes in um, increase in neurotransmitter release and activation of neurotransmitter receptors like the NMDA receptor. That leads to calcium influx, and that activates kinases like CAM kinase and PKA, and then those turn on gene expression, and there's waves of expression that happen after learning in the hippocampus. We actually think about it by analogous to, analogy to what happens with viral infections. Viruses, a lot of viruses bring transcription factors with them. They turn on genes then when they go into the host cell, and that turns in a cascade of genes that are called immediate early genes, early genes, late genes. And by analogy, there's a series of these gene cascades with memory. So I was studying that and studying the molecules that did that, and Laurel joined my lab and she said, well, what are the animals doing? while this is all happening. I don't know. And it's good to have the students ask the <laughs> big questions. What are they doing? I don't know. And so they're they're asleep, it turns out. So we do the training in the morning because that's the, you get up, you go to the lab, mm -hmm. you do the training. Yeah, it's it turns out it's a time when animals are sleeping because we don't have, we didn't have a reverse light dark cycle. So she said, well, there are all these cascades going on, but what if it's driven by sleep? And I said, well, then sleep deprived. So let's take the sleep away. And what was in the first experiment we did, what was so with these molecular cascades, you can do manipulations right at training or three hours later, and you, but if you or eight hours, or we don't see an effect. So we did, we trained animals sleep the for five hours, then tested memory 24 hours later, or we trained animals, waited, sleep deprived them from five to 10 hours and then tested them two hours later. And what in, in contextual memory, hippocampus memory. And what Laurel found was that the deprivation right after training for five hours impaired memory, but not the deprivation for from five to 10 hours. She did another experiment with, and these animals, we played a tone that the animals learned about. So the animals simultaneously learned about a tone and they learned about a box. Then we sleep deprived them, and then we tested memory for the box, the context, or the tone. And so within animals, you could show that the memory for the context was impaired by sleep deprivation, but the memory for the tone was not. Mm. And so that's a particularly experiment that uh, neuroscientists and neurologists, really psychologists like, because you have this within animal control. You've You've affected one kind of memory, but not another, which means that you probably understand the process of 
pretty well. And so this suggested that these brief periods of sleep loss might sleep about 11 hours in a 12 hour period. So five hours of sleep deprivation is like half of that. It's like us sleeping only four hours a night. It's not a huge amount of sleep loss, but it, it impairs contextual, spatial, hippocampus dependent memories in a selective way. We now know that in an experiment actually we're writing up right now where we've done spatial transcriptomics. So the is a cutting edge technology where you can take a brain section and look at the expression of genes across that brain section. We see that sleep loss has dramatically different effects in the hippocampus, the cortex, the thalamus, the amygdala, the stratum. It's dramatic and, and different genes are affected. Some go up, some go down. And the hippocampus is among the most affected regions by this short deprivation of, of short, short sleep deprivation. Yeah, so um, since I retired from my lab chief position at the NIH three years ago, I, well, I, I was always very cognitively active, like I did my best thinking. I, I Anyway, that's my perception anyway in the morning, and I still do. So I do all my critical thinking in the morning, but I don't go to sleep right after it. Right. right? So yeah. um, is there any like practical um, implications of this for people's like daily routine and Oh, so <laughs> now, well, the other the other part of it too is a circadian rhythm, and obviously we're different circadian yeah. patterns. Yeah, the sleep, you know, yeah. So it's it's that is an it's an interesting question, and um, you know, we don't. There's the work that's been done. Um, so Jan Born has done some work about it. So it is true that naps. So it is true that you can tell all those working right now can tell your employee that a nap employers that a nap is a good thing. There are experiments done of researchers in humans that if you learn something and take a nap, you will have a better mm -hmm. memory of it. Yeah, so and Jan Born did some studies. He's gone on to do a lot of mechanistic studies, but his original work in the 90s, he's in Germany now in Tübingen, was previously in Lübeck. He trained uh, trained human subjects at different times of day and he trained them in hippocampus dependent tasks so when we go to sleep first we go into not deep non-REM sleep and he trained them right before that or he trained them in the middle of the night right before REM sleep rich episodes and it has different effects on memory so it is true that that what happens afterwards can have an effect and so uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say just wait and learn everything at the end of the day but because the other factor that's happening when you wake up, you wake up, you know, if your alarm goes off, you wake up, but you have a surge of stress hormones, ACTH, and that's part of what wakes you up. And there's a circadian alerting pattern that's on top of our sleep cycles. So, so there's, this, there's this notion of like, like replaying uh, memories or, you know, we think, we think in sequences of individual memories, you know, yeah. linking you know, multiple things with over time and events. And so is is there any evidence that there's selective, yeah, I guess selective replaying of, of uh, memories that you, you, know, you formed uh, right before you went to sleep? Yeah, so that, yes, there is. And there's, a, there's, there's a, several different views about uh, sleep and, and its impact. One view is this replay view that what happens when we're when we sleep is a replay of experience, and there's evidence to support that from experimental studies in in rodents, uh, and there's also evidence in humans to see this reactivation. Um, and we work with a number of researchers have done that work. Um, the the uh, first was uh, Matt Wilson, some of the early work that he did. Uh, showed that we've been collaborating and working with a guy named Cameron Deba at the University of Michigan. He's done very long-term replay in rodents and seen that. Other researchers uh, think that is about scaling after wakefulness. This is uh, Chiara Trelli and uh, Giulio Tononi at uh, Wisconsin. And it's probably a mix of these two things where, where there's certain circuits that get reactivated during sleep and, and others get downscaled 
And it's a mix of those things. What, what my lab is focused on largely though is the impact of sleep loss yeah. and the idea that, and so we've followed that now in many ways, biochemical. And what's been striking uh, over the years that we've studied this, I think it literally 20, more than 20 years, which is a little scary, um, is that we studied these molecular processes of cyclic AMP signaling and protein synthesis and gene transcription. And we've now found that sleep loss uh, negatively impacts cyclic AMP signaling and protein synthesis, very things that drive memory consolidation. And so uh, it, it, we could have almost predicted it. It's sort of to us, explored it. But the exact thing that I was thinking about waves of cyclic AMP and protein synthesis when Laurel said, think about sleep, and then over the years. And probably the most striking experiments that we've done were experiments that were first done by a grad student, Chris Vesey. The thing about this is that You'll hear what I've just said, two things that it's grad students that have had the impact here. It's grad students, you know, asking interesting questions and not being afraid to ask what might seem like a naive question. Yeah. Nobody's been willing to ask it, right? Yeah. We're all brainwashed yeah. in this sort of union thing where we have these paradigms of how the brain works. So we need people that that are able to ask questions. And that's right. often that's grad students. Um, so could you talk a little, go into a little detail then on some of the, so you looked at these changes in gene expression in multiple brain regions. I know besides the, the cyclic AMP crab, uh, pathway, there's this pathway that's initially, well, it's very important for protein synthesis, the mTOR pathway. We've yeah. been interested in that from the standpoint of energy metabolism and we did a lot of work on intermittent fasting you know yes. our food deprivation and now during sleep the brain remains active there are there are differences obviously be, between the sleeping brain and the awake brain uh however you know one thing i've wondered is and i'll have to add on to this a little bit to try to clarify what i'm getting at yeah. um there's evidence now accumulating that during sleep, the, the, one of the things that may happen is that the brain may clear out potentially toxic substances. Mm -hmm. uh, amyloid has received the most attention, but there's other right. things. And so, you know, I've been thinking over the years, kind of it's important for after after cells are challenged with some stressor, whether it's our neurons being active, when we're thinking, our muscles being active, when we're exercising, it's important to have a recovery period. And, and before we knew that the brain was, neural networks are still active during sleep, you know, kind of one of the general thinking was, well, sleep is a time when your neurons rest and recover. Right. Um, so, and then, you know, there's this evidence that these, challenge recovery cycles uh, do different things. During the challenge, there's actually a down regulation of protein synthesis, at least overall protein synthesis. There's a uh, up regulation uh, of autophagy mm -hmm. and, you know, it's a kind of garbage removal system. And then during the, the recovery period, the rest, sleep, eating, then the cells kind of get, go into a growth and plasticity mode. So I, I don't know if you've thought about this or not, but do you think that during sleep there's, so some of the changes may be similar to what's going on with, you know, rest, resting your muscle cells after exercise, but then there's because they don't the neurons aren't really going to sleep they're not resting completely of course we know that neurons never rest completely so have you thought about this at all yeah so i think well i think there's a, a number of people in the field that have and it's related to the theories that i talked to you about mentioned briefly one is a theory uh that focuses the comeostasis that's been referred to as shy 
And that is the idea that during sleep, there's a downscaling of synapses. And that would fit with the downscaling in neuronal activity that would fit with the clearing clearance through the lymphatic system yeah. um, th that you discussed. But it, it's all clear that that's not the sole thing that's happening during sleep. For example, during sleep in non-REM sleep, there are these firing patterns called sharp wave ripples. And sharp wave ripples are brief transient firing patterns that happen in the hippocampus. And they're, they're neurons firing at that are 200 hertz for like 200 milliseconds. That would normally do one of two things, either induce a seizure yeah. or induce long-term potentiation of synapses. So in fact, and, and Yuri Bazaki pointed this out in a book chapter a while ago, that in fact, the time when, when uh, synapt synaptic plasticity inducing stimuli are happening in the brain is in non-REM sleep. And, and so that, that's not everywhere. It's in, it's locally, you can record it from like tetrodes and see it on, on one tetrode and not another. So there's, there's also this ongoing activity. And so we think that when animals, when we keep animals awake, what we're doing is preventing this clearance that you described. And that means that we, that, uh, that then the, uh, the, the the neurons get more and more active. We're also preventing in part this replay. So the one thing that we were able to do, and that I we're very we're one of the very few labs that have done, that have done this, is that a lot of the work you have in science, particularly in, in the sleep field, has been correlative. So you you correlate something. You you record something. You see how it changes. You you or you look at something. You look at neuronal activity and you see it go up or down with sleep, and then you attribute the function of sleep to that change in neuronal activity. But fewer experiments have gone in and manipulated those. Now we're doing more and more of these with the, uh, the dreads and the optogenetics that have been developed, and it is tremendous. Um, but we, what we've done with sleep loss, we were the first to do this, is to uh, do a sort of rescue experiment. So if the, if the loss of sleep is because you're getting reductions in cyclic AMP levels or you're getting reductions in protein synthesis, then you should be able to give back cyclic AMP, give back protein synthesis, and that should prevent the memory impairing uh, effects of sleep loss. And that's in fact what uh, Chris Vesey did in a, a paper we had in Nature a long time ago, where he and, and was able to show if you treated them with a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that gave them more cyclic AMP, you could sleep deprive them and they would still have their memory. So, um, and we've more recently done that with regulations of protein synthesis. A woman named Jen Tudor, who's now at St. Joe's University, just received tenure in biology there. She expressed some uh, translational regulatory molecules that the, the molecule is 4-EBP2. It um, regulates the initiation of translation. It's a target of mTOR. Um, and you can, you can manipulate that and, and, uh, and increase protein synthesis. And then you can sleep deprived animals and it has no effect. And so those experiments that are really functional tests of what we think is happening are really critical. Because there's a lot of reasons why our correlations might lead us astray. Yeah. And then with the mTOR pathway, so then rapamycin, if you inhibit the mTOR pathway, will that prevent the consolidation of memories? Yes. Yeah, it does. There's been a number of those experiments, and one of the people that's done the, some of the most elegant ones are Mauro Cust uh, Custioli and um, uh, also uh, Nahum Sonnenberg okay. uh, and McGill. And so those work where they've done these... Uh, they've done these selective manipulations of the eukaryotic initiation factors and rate factors. Uh, Eric Klan also has done a number of them, those. What's interesting is that those are also affected, they, they regulate metabolism, as you said, they're also linked to disease. So there's, which is, they're very, in, very interesting intersection of uh, metabolism, sleep and brain disorders. Now the, the phosphodiesterase inhibitor, so that prevents the breakdown of the cyclic AMP so that the cyclic AMP levels in the neurons stay up. And 
I guess, you know, for people who aren't in, in the field of molecular biology, neuroscience, it's me, but there's someone listening or viewing to this, uh, they probably heard of Viagra. Right. right? And it, it inhibits the phosphodiesterase. It actually prevents breakdown of a different, of a, a kind of related molecule called cyclic GMP. Yes. And so have you got a, over the years, I've gotten approached several times by the military, you uh -huh. know, asking me, you know, they've got these soldiers, they have to stay alert and, and, you know, their brain functioning really well for extended periods of times, 24 hours, 48 hours. Uh, you know, are they interested in, or for all I know, are they using phosphodiesterase, giving phosphodiesterase? I don't, I, don't, I don't know. There's now, and there now are new classes of phosphodiesterase inhibitors, though. There previously were compounds like rolopram that were catalytic inhibitors, but there are now allosteric regulators that actually have been tested in fragile X syndrome and seem to be much, much um, better tolerated and more brain permeant. And so it, it's actually very interesting. Um, we, uh, we ha have, a, yeah, we haven't, I, I'm not, I'm not aware of those experiments, but the one thing I would say is that in general, um, one of the things about sleep is that endogenous sleep, normal sleep, it has a certain pattern of REM, non-REM and episodes that I think are going to be very difficult to replicate. Um, yeah. Drugs that are taken that drive sleep typically drive one state or the other. Yeah. There's more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I would say that's an interesting concept that would be interesting to, to, to discuss here for a little bit. Okay. We, I first postulated that we first postulated this when I was finishing my postdoc and starting at Penn. And it's this idea that there exists these things called memory suppressor genes. So these phosphodiesterases that we're talking about are interesting because they're breaks on signaling. So normally when you induce memory, you activate uh, uh, neurotransmitter receptors and calcium influx and cyclic AMP, and that drives um, plasticity and memory storage. But there are other gene products like phosphodiesterases that are breaks and they stop it. They degrade cyclic AMP or, they, or uh, other things like HDAC inhibitors, uh, HDACs, and sorry, can uh, block transcription even transcriptional repressors. And so we developed this, uh, this name for these genes by analogy to tumor genes, that there would be memory suppressor genes. And this was in 1998 in a perspective science. And there was a review in 2021 that, uh, that was written uh, in what, what Ron Davis wrote. And now there's like 150 memory suppressor genes. So it's kind of fun to ha have this sort of idea. And I think a lot of them are, are likely to be good for uh, cognitive enhancement. What, with, when you think about enhancing memory, you could think about just driving more potentiation, or you could think about regulating the brakes to allow more potentiation to happen when it would naturally happen. Drive more memory or drive more potentiation, you're likely to just saturate the system. But if you take out a break and let the natural system give a signal, then maybe you'll have more effect. So. And also the the break issue is relevant to things like post-traumatic stress disorder. I was I was thinking and, and looking through some of your review articles before you know preparing for this podcast that so uh a, a, acute sleep deprivation can um, impair the consolidation of memories. So, if, of course, I guess if someone has a traumatic disorder, they might not be sleeping much anyway. But is it? Would you predict that after someone has a traumatic experience, experience, if you force them to stay awake, that they may not retain the memory of that? Ex that event as easily. Well, one of the things about post-traumatic stress is that it's it's it involves typically involves emotionally uh, salient memories, and the uh, that those are mediated 
often you're you're learning about a con it's some stimulus like a context or you think about you hear a helicopter noise and you re recall your experience in battle but but a significant part of that is the emotional valence of the stimulus and our data for uh, uh, our animal experiments and other experiments in humans are that that emotionally driven memory is less sensitive to sleep loss than the memory just of the event. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, it, it makes one, sense. One connection with mood that is not that well known, but is very interesting. So, you know, it, and this has to do with uh, antidepressant efficacy. So when we think about drugs, antidepressant drugs that, that are taken like uh, Prozac or other SSRIs, they have to be taken for several weeks to have an effect. They increase serotonin rapidly, but their behavior is an antidepressant for several weeks. There's only a few things that are very rapid. So ketamine now is a rapidly antidepressant. Electric convulsive shock therapy is uh, as well. It turns out that uh, brief sleep deprivation, one night of sleep deprivation, is also an acute antidepressant. Hmm. And no one actually knows the mechanism for that. And uh, it it's, it's, wouldn't suggest people stay up all night to feel better. It's going to hmm. has all these other problems. But, but um, it, it is true. And uh, we've been trying to think about how that might connect to what we now know about ketamine, and, and another, you know, as a rapidly acting antidepressant. And we don't have any particular ideas. Although there are some evidence that ketamine regulates protein synthesis, some evidence from Lisa Montagia at Vanderbilt. That might be the connection. We don't have a, a good hypothesis, but um, it, that's an, an interesting, interesting re area of research from my perspective. Yeah, so you mentioned serotonin and, and of course uh, uh, all the work at least in in rodents, uh, the mammals, although Eric Kandel's, you know, early work was in the sea slug of plesia, and, and there he was actually looking at serotonin, right? Yes. The serotonergic synapses, but these synapses you've been talking about are predominantly glutamatergic. In fact, pretty much yes. in mammals, it seems like pretty much all the studies done looking electrophysiologically, recording synaptic strength, and so on. Uh, in relation to learning and memory are done in, in neurons that deploy glutamate. What about other neurotransmitters? And so throughout the, and I've mentioned this before in other podcasts, and some people who aren't familiar with neuroscience may not know this, but approximately 90% of all the nerve cells in your brain deploy glutamate as their neurotransmitter. The second most abundant neurotransmitter is GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter. And throughout your entire cerebral cortex, your cerebellum, hippocampus, it's only glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons in those brain regions. These other neurotransmitters, serotonin, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, dopamine, they're produced by <laughs> very small number of neurons, relatively speaking, in discrete brain regions, but they have axons that go throughout the cortex, hippocampus, and they form synapses on these glutamatergic neurons that you're talking about in the context of learning and memory. Um, is there any work manipulating these other neurotransmitter systems and, and looking at some of the same behavioral electrophysiological endpoints in the same models? Yeah, so there's, uh, uh, there is work with interneurons, so the so-called, the neurons that are using GABA or GABA as an inhibitory transmitter, at least in, in adults or after the chloride conductance changes developmentally, they're inhibitory. Um, the, um, there's a number of studies showing that they are differentially affected by sleep deprivation. We haven't, uh, we have, my lab has not done those, but there's other labs. One is Sarah Aton at the uh, University of Michigan. And so those are, the, they're definitely true. And then it, different sleep wake states involve different neuromodulation. So these uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, uh, that you mentioned, or, or hypocretin is another example of a system uh, 
that is a regulate sleep wake states um and was just recognized in the breakthrough prize uh those change in different sleep wake states and it's it there's a sort of different neurochemistry of the brain the waking brain has certain modulators the sleeping brain has others there'd be a woman who would be great to have on your podcast her name is gina poe she's okay. at ucla and she's been studying um these neuromodulators in in sleep and sleep loss she would be a great person to have okay. on. all right uh, so that yeah. sounds good. Um, you, you know, you mentioned. So, talk a little bit about structural changes. I know you've you've done a little work asking, you know, are there differences? Does sleep deprivation affect the number of synapses, and say hippocampus neurons, and and if you if you manipulate your cyclic AMP Krebs system using your molecular tools, some of these modern tools, can you, um, can you, uh, I, I guess, prevent the effects of sleep deprivation on the structural changes? Yeah, so that's in fact what we found, though it's work that Robert Havkus, who was, when he was a postdoc in the lab, what he did was look at, he looked at den, what are called dendritic spines. And I have to get a little bit specific because, um, I'll, I'll tell him a little bit what, what's kind of a, a big open question. And so what he did was look at the effect of sleep loss and found that when animals were sleep deprived, there were fewer of these so-called dendritic spines. Dendritic spines are these little blebs that come out of right in near the postsynaptic part of a synapse, or they're, they're basically the postsynaptic part of a synapse. Um, and what Robert found was that they were decreased after sleep deprivation. And we think that was driven by regulation of a molecule called cofillin, which regulates the cytoskeleton that's kind of under the dendritic spine. And that's a downstream of cyclic AMP. And so he could rescue that effect by manipulating cofillin and make the spines res essentially resilient. Now, what's become clear, other researchers have found that in some cases, sleep loss can increase spines. We found a decrease, we found a decrease in spines, other researchers have found an increase in And it's, we found then looking more closely that along the dendritic length, there are spines in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is arranged spatially, uh, very clearly. And if you're very close to the soma, actually uh, there's a lot of inhibitory input there. And th there it's actually sleep loss gives it a little bit of an increase in spines. Further down where the inputs come that are glutamatergic, from the so-called Schaefer collaterals from CA3, there we see a decrease. So there's different spines appear to be potentially sensitive to sleep loss, which is very interesting. You'll notice I tried to change the, the ver wording from synapses to spines. Yeah. And I did that because we actually don't know that any of these are synapses. We know they're spines. Yeah. And, and what's striking about this is that what Robert found is that, uh, that five or six hours of sleep deprivation reduces spines. If animals go back to sleep for three hours and you count spines again, you don't, you see a normal level. Wow. So, uh, so, yeah. what, so if you think about them as synapses, they have this presynaptic terminal. So this is going this way. This is staying out. I, I mean, it, it doesn't, I don't understand it. Yeah, the time the timing seems you know can it can you really form a functional synapse that quickly and then, uh, yeah. but spines. So you mentioned cofillin. Now you're bringing back memories of my postdoc work. <laughs> so my postdoc was with Stan Cater at Colorado State. Stan was actually on the was at, at, at Iowa. Was Iowa, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, so I was a graduate student, not in his lab, in another lab, and and when he went to Colorado, the timing was just right, and he asked me if I wanted to do a postdoc. And so Stan was studying growth cones, right? Right. And, you know, the motile ends of the axons or dendrites that are growing as, as neurons grow and then form synapses during development. And um, so my main discovery in my postdoc work was that glutamate, plays an important role in the formation of synapses during brain development. At that time, that wasn't, that hadn't been known. Uh -huh. And so the, the, 
kind of the idea is that you've got a, and we, we showed actually that growing axonal growth cones can release glutamate. Okay. So the idea is you have a, a growing axon, its growth cone releases glutamate, then the glutamate binds to glutamate receptors on the dendrite of, of the nether neuron that's growing. And then what happens is you get these very rapid projections of these fine, they're called philopodia, that have actin in them, which is one of the major yep. filamentous proteins in the cytoskeleton. So it turns out there's a guy, a uh, faculty at Colorado State named Jim Bamberg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Who actually discovered co-filling? Yeah, we used some of his reagents. This yeah. S3A and, and F3D. And, yeah. and so what you're probably one thing you're very likely seeing is um okay, so you you sleep divide, so you get decrease in number of spines or whatever, and then uh and then you can get a rapid increase if you Activate cyclic AMP pathway, is that right? Yes. Oh, yep. You're right. And so then probably what's happening, you get these rapid projection of these philopodia like things out of the dendrite. And that's like the kind of the initial step in the formation of the dendritic spine and the and the potential oh. syn potential synapse. Yeah. yeah. Those philopodia are probably too small to see in like can you see them in Golgi staining or other staining? Yeah, you should. Yeah, you can see. Yep. Because yeah. we didn't see, we didn't see, we looked at different types of spines. Well, you, we you may see these, they're, they're almost like hair-like projections perpendicular to the dendrite. And okay. they might even be between the spines. Uh-huh. So, but. Yeah, I'm going to go back and look at that. So of course, if you, if you want to get really ambitious, you could do electron microscopy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, some people have, and uh, they've actually seen these opposite things. But one of the challenges with electron microscopy is you wind up looking at such a small region; it's hard to. Yeah. So it's it's uh, obviously very powerful, but but challenging. We're yeah, but but, but now so so, yeah. so Ted, you know, you can easily and pretty much all my postdoc work was looking at neurons growing across a culture dish, their growth cone. Yeah. And it's easy just under the light microscope, um, you know, with a actually even a 10, 20x, certainly a 40x objective, right. you can get beautiful images of philopodia. So, yeah, you can definitely see them at the light microscope level. Yeah, we could even do that. I mean, now that we have these, so for example, we can, if we decrease levels of cyclic AMP, we kind of mimic sleep deprivation. So there are some ways we could even do it in a dish, which huh. would be kind of fun. We haven't, you know, one of the challenges about being a principal investigator is our job becomes trying to convince grad students these are interesting questions. So I have to, that's the and, and also you have, you know, you may have a little more freedom in this regard than others because, you, you know, you've got a big lab and so on, and uh, you can take a little more risks, but oftentimes you're constrained somewhat by the specific aims of the grants you're funded yeah. through. But I, yeah. I actually, and I'm not giving advice here. I actually never paid much attention to that in my career. Yeah. I, I just, you know, if we had something come up interesting, I'd just go right. in a different direction. No, I definitely, I, that, me too. I, yeah. uh, that's, and I think maybe a little attention deficit challenges there <laughs> for me, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. So. Um, so you mentioned, you know, one thing, I, again, in reading some of your recent review articles and thinking about this and, so you mentioned cell culture and, and a lot of work looking at the cellular courts of learning and memory are done in hippocampal slices, right? Yeah. Recording. Yeah. And so we know that if you take cells, individual cells out of the brain or body and you put them in culture, they retain their circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. uh, has anyone looked, say, in, in organotypic, what's so-called long-term slice cultures of the hippocampus, whether there's sleep-like patterns of activity that are maintained over days in culture? Yeah, people, have, people have tried to look at some of that. You need to play with, the, play with the neuromodulators and I think, and try to get the right balance. I don't think anybody's found that. Yeah. But what we found though, what uh, the student I talked about a little while ago, what he did 
was to take a brain slice from a sleep deprived animal. And you see LT, you see deficits in synaptic plasticity, this thing we call long-term potentiation yeah. in that slice from a sleep deprived animal. So it's stable. So you yeah. do have a stable effect. Mm -hmm. We were very surprised by that. Um, and that enabled us to dissect a lot of these manipulations because we now all of a sudden had a thing in a, in a dish that was sleep deprived. But then so, can you take the can you take the the hippocampal slice in a dish from an animal that's been sleep deprived and increase cyclic AMP and then increase uh, kind of recover the number of dendritic spines? Uh, so we didn't look at spines, but if you increase cyclic AMP, you can induce plasticity. Yeah. So if you just do it electrically, it has they have plasticity deficits, but you can overcome them by uh, by reversing the effects of sleep deprivation. Okay, I see. So, sort yeah. of good. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, we're about in an hour, I think. Yeah. Do you have something right now scheduled? Uh, no, I I'm fine. Okay, let, let's take a few more minutes. I'm almost done. I, I'm i sure. looking at the things I kind of jotted down quickly here. Sure. So what what about, so I guess briefly mentioned from a societal standpoint, I think everybody knows that sleep deprivation is bad, but could you kind of put it in some context of, you know, maybe historically, how many people have been sleep deprived? Is it getting worse with the modern technology? What are some of the the potential disorders, actually diseases that can result from sleep deprivation? Depression is one that for a chronic chronic deprivation. For chronic sleep deprivation. Yeah, there's a, a couple that I think a couple things that are important to say. I think the first is that um, we often think that we can catch up on our sleep, so we think that it will kind of deal with the work week and then we'll catch up on the weekend. Yeah. And there have been some very interesting studies by David Dinges at uh, Penn uh, and Hans van Dongen, who's at Washington State University. And they've done these things if in human subjects. Um, uh, other people at Seisler at Harvard have as well. And, and they've done where they've let people do like a week. So you only sleep like four hours a, a night. Then you try to go to sleep over the weekend and, and then they measure it. And, and, and what's been striking you, people think, after a weekend of sleep that they're caught up. But when you measure other things, like they do this attention task, where you know how well you can, how quickly you can identify whether a dot's moving left or right, very simple tasks. But being sleep deprived affects your ability to do that, just mm -hmm. like it affects your ability to drive. And you, you, even though you think you've caught up on sleep, you still have a deficit in your ability to attend stimuli is a sign of being sleep deprived. And so I think the, the important thing to kind of get across to folks is that it really is a necessary thing. It's not something you can catch up on the weekend. And it's not something that you have a good idea about, that we deceive ourselves about thinking we're awake or another cup of coffee or whatever. So that, that's, that's the first thing I would say. That has important implications for the current kind of scheduling of our educational system. And, you know, yes. I was just thinking when I was growing up, you know, going to middle school, high school, I was kind of on that schedule where I didn't get that much sleep during the week because we had to get up early in the morning. I took the bus to school. We lived out in the country. So get up at six in the morning and then, you know, Oftentimes I had some sports after school and then at homework. And then and then I remember distinctly on the weekend mornings, I would sleep really late. This kind of is a natural thing. But you're saying that may not be enough. And maybe, I don't know, are, are we really having the right kind from a standpoint of cognition optimization? And is this kind of a schedule for our kids the best? thing right it's it, and, it, and it's not there's it's not. A work by mary carskadden who's been very active she's at brown university and there what's the other thing that's interesting is kindergartners which some of which start at noon because they're on the afternoon kindergarten they're up at 6 a.m running around like it's you're like it's two in the afternoon and and the the high schoolers are still asleep and the high schoolers have to be at school at 7 a.m we got to 
completely backwards. And, and there's, there's a number of school districts that are changing that. I mean, it's driven by a lot of things, uh, bus schedules, sports schedules, but that's a mix of both sleep and circadian rhythms that are challenges. The other thing that I think is very, very important is that, that sleep is a critical indicator of health. And uh, paying attention to not, not sleeping, paying attention to problems you might have with uh, snoring or other things that you think you're having problems with are really important to follow up on. And there's evidence that a sleep loss drives uh, obesity and sleep loss in middle age drives neurodegenerative disorders uh, in later age. David Holtzman and others have shown that clearly. You've shown that with your fasting and other with, uh, with meta effects of metabolism. But sleep plugs directly into all of that. And it's really critical. And there are some very striking examples. Parkinson's disease, there's a disorder called REM behavior disorder. And when we're in REM sleep, we uh, are we have atonia, so we don't move. Our brain is active, but we're not moving. The disorder where you actually move during REM sleep, and you would not just not talk about sleepwalking. Literally, in some cases, you might hit a partner next to you. Yeah. That REM disorder is uh, connected to dopaminergic signaling in the midbrain and is a predictor of Parkinson's disease. Hmm. And so sleep is a critical uh, thing, not just for our alertness, but for our health. And um, I think if we can all do something more to not have phones uh, beside our beds and, and have what some people call sleep hygiene of having you know a, a time you go to sleep and a place you go to sleep, it makes a big difference and it makes a big difference in light across the lifespan. You know, Ted, so, so, and this was a bit came as a big surprise to me. So that uh, last uh, I've snored for, you know, years and didn't pay much attention to it. And then I started having a lot of tiredness, you know, afternoon tiredness. And, you know, I'm, I'm skinny and in good, sh you know, a good, cardiovascular yeah. health and everything else and i went in lo and behold i had obstructive sleep apnea so now i'm i'm doing cpap machine every night and it it i can tell it helps it, it's helped a lot yeah. so but i you know so that's kind of a people should be aware that snoring could be an indicator you know excessive snoring could be an right. indicator of this and this uh this can prevent you from getting a good night's sleep and you'll be tired. I, I think it's also a risk factor for hypertension. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so good sleep hygiene, critical. Now, last thing, Ted. Uh, uh, do you, based on your work, and what you would kind of talked about a little bit from the standpoint of pharmacological approaches, any treatments do you see in the future for maybe enhancing the quality of sleep beyond just going to sleep quickly? Oh, um, yeah, I don't, you know, there, there definitely are a lot of companies working on pharmacological, um, uh, obviously, approaches to help sleep. I think, it, honestly, one of the most important things is the activity we do during the day. Uh, mm -hmm. that drives how we sleep. But but I'd actually like to make another comment, which is to take that comment and, and use it to make another point. And I, I hope that's okay to end yeah. with. And that ends with this. We, I, I don't, I hope that what we do will impact uh, treatment in the future. Um, but what I've done has been driven curiosity by trying to understand how it is that billions of neurons and gazillion synapses can actually give a world that makes sense to us that we can remember and think about and discuss. And um, I'm so struck by what we're able to do now at the circuit level and molecular level. And to me, that is a very important uh, advance in our knowledge of who we are as human beings and how our brain works and how we interact with the world around us. And to me, it's that knowledge that is what the value is. Yeah. 
And uh, I think we have a lot of our science that is driven too much I agree. by trying to cure a disease. Yeah. And in many ways, I think our insight into disease may come when we take our foot off of that accelerator pedal and yeah. think about the biology and how the body works and how the brain works and what is exciting to us about that and what can we do creatively to understand it. And then, yeah, but, you know, this- uh, so Stan Cater, who I worked with, worked on snails, right? And identified yeah. neurons from snails. Eric Kandel, his early work was there. That work, you know, was in the 1960s, even 60s, 70s. And NIH funding then, the they were wide open to basic research. It didn't yes. it didn't have any any obvious implications for disease. It was just, you know, the best science to try to understand biology, in this case, how the brain works, what's going on, all the details. And now it's exactly right. There's become too much of an emphasis on, on, and it's important, but unfortunately, I think by, by reducing relatively the funding for basic discovery, they're reducing the opportunities for new insights. And, you know, I'm in the Alzheimer's field and there's been all this focus on the amyloid from way back. And I, I kind of, I, I wasn't really interested early on in trying to something to target amyloid. And now we've got after 30 years, these drugs coming out, they're monoclonal antibodies against the amyloid. Right. There's questions. Their FDA is approving, actually approved so they one. Just did. They just approved one today. Yeah. Yeah, and these in the clinical trials, they have. I mean, the effect is so minimal that it's. And and some scientists in the field who are experts would say it's not really meaningful. You know, so we need to know more about what's going on rather than this. Oh, this one thing is going on. And then it turns out, oh, that that wasn't the whole answer to it. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. So Ted, thanks for taking the time. I know you're you're a busy guy there. And uh, what what's your? Oh, your son's majoring in German. He's a junior. He is. Yeah, he's a German major. Yeah. So he's. Uh, it's funny. He started German. He, he was uh, in sixth grade, and uh, so when he was really young, he wasn't in a classroom. So when he first learned English, he wasn't really with peers. And so it's interesting. He was in a German. It was in, it was in German that he learned how to like interact with <laughs> peers. So uh, it's it's fun. He he just finished a German literature course that was a uh, quite a challenge, much more challenging than the Beatles course he took. Because it's <laughs> but anyway. But, uh, All uh, right, good. It's fun. Well, again, so much. Have a, have a great rest of twenty twenty three. Okay. Thanks, Mark. See you later. Bye.